praise cause I know you're still in control my praise is a weapon it's more than a sound and my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down
Good morning. We have just completed an amazing month of learning about the work of the Holy Spirit and then experiencing the beauty of God working out something remarkable in our lives. We did that through our three-week series on Holy Spirit, and then we had our Sampling Remarkable meetings. We can say without a doubt that the Lord has challenged us, He's changed us, He's worked in our lives a deep work, He's done powerful things, He has cultivated things in our lives, and it's our responsibility now to build upon what He's cultivated. So that brings us to this next step. What do we do after having these wonderful experiences with the Lord? What do we do after we've encountered Jesus in such a powerful way? How are we going to live out these life-altering, life-changing experiences? And that's the question, if you will, of Christianity. That's the living out of the fruit of the Spirit. So I'd like to start there today with these scriptures that we finished with two weeks ago on the teachings of the Holy Spirit. Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse. Galatians 5, 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions, but... When you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension and division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living with That living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to this cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another to be jealous of one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. It's inspired and errant and infallible. We are so grateful that you allow us to open it up and to gain the the valuable revelation that we need to live this life in a fruitful way. So, Lord, as you challenge and change us through your word, give us ears to hear and hearts to apply, and as always, make us good soil, that the seed of your word might go deep into our heart and bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we read Galatians, we need to understand something. Paul is writing to a group of people that have heard, uh, heard about and experienced all the teaching that we've heard on the Holy Spirit. He's explaining to them that the Holy Spirit that has worked so mightily within them now must produce fruit out of them. So after listening, listing the works of the flesh, complete with even saying at the end of all those terrible things of the fleshly life, Paul will add this little phrase, other sins like these. In other words, he's saying there are so many works of the flesh, it's more than can be named. He then lists this wonderful fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But then he gets to the words that are really needed, actually, then to live out what we would call Christianity. What is that really all about? So after listing these powerful fruits, he gets to the meat of the matter, and he gets to what Christianity really is in verse 24 and 25. He said, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And then he said, since we are living by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Those verses declare two vitally important things about the Christian life. Two vitally important things, valuable principles that if we can understand, they are the very essence of the Christian life. The first is simply this. You and I, when we give our life to Christ, are positionally righteous. 
we are positionally righteous because of what Christ has done in us and for us. He went to the cross. He died for our sins. And when we give our lives to him, he then takes our sinful nature and our sinful desires and passions and nails them to the cross as well. So we are positionally declared righteous. Then the second aspect comes into these verses. He says, we are then to practically live out our position. We are to practically live out our position. But that is up to us. Because in these two, ver- in these two verses here, Paul explains that the responsibility changes. It changes from what Christ did for us. He was responsible to make us positionally righteous. And he says, now the responsibility goes to us. How will we live out what he has done in us? Since we, he says, are living by the Spirit, we are to walk out the Spirit. So our focus this past month has been, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. That has been our focus. So what then is our next step? This, this is why Jesus gave a commission to his disciples post-resurrection. He gave this commission to them before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit power in Acts 2 that we talked about a couple weeks ago. And what was that commission? Well, we're very familiar with it. What was that commission that Jesus gave to his disciples after teaching them on the Holy Spirit? He will say these words in Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember, this is post-resurrection. And he says, therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus says this, go and make disciples. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. He says, here's your commission discipleship, becoming a disciplined follower. He says, you go forth yourself and be a disciplined follower and then raise up disciplined followers coming after you. So let's backtrack a little and see what Jesus said about this and how it applies to our lives. We're going to look at what Jesus said concerning this whole thought of becoming a disciple. Let's start by looking at what we have titled this series. This series is titled, Hand to the Plow. Where did that phrase come from? Well, go in your Bibles to Luke, the ninth chapter, and let's begin to unfold this wonderful, powerful message of discipleship. Verse 57 of Luke, the ninth chapter. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, come follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first, let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. So, hand to the plow. Now, notice what happens here. This is a a scripture that Jesus shares. This is a truth that Jesus shares declares it's all about focus, all about focus. Jesus is giving these folks who have a lot of agriculture, a lot of farming around them, an illustration that they can see right in front of them. A plow would have been a, 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 a one bottom shear on a plow, and it would have had a handle that came up. The hold that handle, that plow then is attached to the back of an oxen or a donkey or a a workhorse of some kind. And that plow then is put into the ground to break up the soil. And as that sharp edge of that plow goes into the ground, it's easy for it to go in all kinds of different directions. So the responsibility of the one plowing puts his hand to the plow and is to focus. Now, that focus is to be on a very clear object at the end of the field that does not move. 
In other words, you can't look at the, at the, at the animal that's pulling. You can't look at something that's moving. You need to find a tree or something at the end that does not move because that way you can plow a straight furrow. And as you plow a straight furrow, that will allow you for the next furrow to be straight and the next furrow. So it's very important to lay down the, the thought of running back and forth, but to focus intentionally. And so Jesus uses this illustration to those that are thereby uh, listening to him so that they will understand he is saying discipleship is all about focus and a willingness to put the hand to the plow and focus. Now, notice that Jesus will say at the end of these scriptures that you should put your hand to plow. Let me, let me read it again. Anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. So he's saying if you put your hand to the plow and you start looking back and looking there, what will happen is you'll go off in different directions. So he says you must stay focused ahead. Now, please note here, they will not enter. It doesn't say they will not enter the kingdom of God. He says they are not fit for the kingdom of God. That's a very important aspect. He says, basically, they will get into the kingdom of God. They have chosen to give their life to Jesus Christ. They are positionally righteous, but they're not practically living it out. They are kind of doing this every once in a while and doing this every once in a while. And so their life does this. And we see that so many times in the church of Jesus Christ. And that's not true Christianity. It's kind of churchianity. I do well for a little bit. I cycle out. I cycle in. I do okay. I'm here every once in a while. I do okay. I'm, I may be involved in a, in a hope group. I, then I go, do kind of do my own thing for a while. And that's what we see so much. But that's not the Christianity, the kingdom life that God wants us to have. He wants us to have a focused life. So he says they're just not fit for it. I I liken them to what I call sideline dwellers. Now, I'm a, I'm a person who likes to work with, a, with football and, and that kind of thing. So let me give you this illustration. There are those who will never enter the game. They are sideline, what I call sideline dwellers. They like the uniform. They like the thrill of being close to the action. They like the camaraderie of the other players. But they don't like the hard work and discipline of the training they don't want to put in the effort to be part of the real game plan. They just want to be part of the team, but not fit for the field. They want to be part of the team, wear the uniform, look good, have the camaraderie, and maybe cheer others on, but they don't want to put in the discipline to be on the field. You and I have been indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and He has indwelled us for greatness. And he's filled us to impact our culture around us. In fact, we have been declared the masterpiece of God to bring forth the works he's called us to. That does not mean you and I are called to be sideline dwellers. It means that we are called to be disciplined followers, set apart to do his work and get on the field. Today, I want to look at three aspects of discipleship to set the tone for the next couple of weeks. I want us to... To look and discuss the life of the disciple and see how it looks like and embrace it as our own life. First thing I want you to see today as you look at Luke 9 and as we walk through this is number one, there will always be distractions. There will always be distractions. Now in the context of the verses, what we just read that Jesus simply points out three distractions and he does that to prove how easy it is to take away our focus. Now, Remember this, write it down. Distractions aren't necessarily bad things. They just aren't the main thing. I'll explain that in a moment. Distractions aren't necessarily bad things. They just aren't the main thing. They're those things in life that steal away our focus. Now, the writer of Hebrews calls them weights. Now, I want you to look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and I want you to just listen to what you hear here and the difference in what the writer will say to us. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, now he's referring back to chapter 11, the, what we call the, the hall of faith, the faith of great people of God, sought God, people just like us, masterpieces of God, positionally righteous people who did the work of the kingdom. And he said, since that's our audience, a huge crowd of witnesses, let us strip aside 
or strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by, here's the focus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So the writer says, let's strip aside or strip away every weight that, get this, slows us down. And I note the difference. He says, sin trips us up, weights slow us down. Weights are distractions. They rob us of our focus. Sin is obvious. Let's get rid of all sin. Why? Because it trips us up. It leaves us on the road scratched up and, and all messed up and, and our life a mess, bloody and bruised. But weights, he said, just simply slow us down. They get us off track so we're not plowing straight. Now note, we do this, he says, by keeping our eyes on Jesus. And that's the key to discipleship. Our eye level must remain on Jesus. Now, when we think of distractions, it's easy to name things that can steal our time and our attention. We can name them. We can say things like the phone, things like television, all kinds of social media, sports, all those things. But I think when we name those, that becomes the easy thing for us to talk about. Those are the outward things. Okay, put your phone down. Quit watching television. And we say, now get in the Word. Do that kind of thing. But I think we fail to see the greatest distraction of our spiritual life. Here's what I see as the greatest distraction. Write it down. Unexpected annoyances. Unexpected annoyances. Now, here's why. They aren't full-on spiritual attacks. They are what I call the little harassments that are thrown at us and to throw us off focus. Little harassments. Unexpected unexpected annoyances. Because what they do, now listen, what they do is they suck up our emotional energy and they leave us fatigued and easy prey for our lost focus. And once we lose focus, then we're going to experience greater spiritual attack. Think about it. Flat tires on the way to work. Appliances that need to be repaired. A schedule change at work that you didn't expect. A kid who's a little sick today and might need to stay home from school. A pet who's sick that you got to get to the veterinary. A letter from the IRS that appears in your mailbox. And the list can go on and on. It's just stuff that annoys us. Stuff that we have to deal with. And it throws us off our norm and it sucks the emotional energy out of our life. Two weeks ago, I got home uh, from the church And yes, I had on my dresser, my wife had placed a letter from the Internal Revenue Service. Now, I would like to tell you that I just took that letter and I opened it up and I went, well, this is nothing. But I open that letter up and I see that it goes all the way back to the 2021 return. Now, if you're not familiar, it's 2023 right now. And so 2021 return. And I'm I'm thinking, what is this about? It didn't make any sense to me at all. Now, I'd like to tell you, that, hey, I just got that, set it aside. I thought, I'll just talk to the person who does our taxes a couple of days. It's no big deal. But you know what it did? It sucked emotional energy out of me. I thought, what does this letter mean? What, what are they saying? We need to pay more? Da, da, da. All these things were, are going through my mind. I, I can't figure it out. So I text a friend of mine who does taxes sometimes. Send him a picture. I don't know. I can't figure it out. Well, this is no help at all. And so most of that night, I'm sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? How, what do I you, annoyances, unexpected. The next morning, I was at my tax accountant's office by 9 a.m. I showed it to her. She said, oh, I just need to see that return. And, and guess what? By the end of that day, I found out that, yes, we had overpaid in taxes about $20, $27 in, 19, in 2021. And we had overpaid $27. All of that, but you know what? It pretty much ruined my day as far as emotional focus. Distracted me. That's what I'm talking about. We don't talk about that stuff much because they aren't the obvious. They're not the ones that everyone can see, but they're where we live. They're where we live, and they distract us and get us away from the focus of the kingdom. 
just stuff. Paul appears to see this and understand it, and he will write to the people in Thessalonica about it. And he gives them what I would call a checklist in dealing with distractions. I love how he puts these. They're just really quick and to the point. It's in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, the 15th verse. He says, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. You know, somebody's bugging you. It's bothered you. Somebody has said something. It fills. What's it do? It distracts you. It emits your emotional. Always be joyful. Next on the checklist. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies. Test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. It's like Paul said, here is a checklist that will allow you and I to not fall into those areas of distraction, those unexpected annoyances. He said, keep yourself set apart. Keep yourself pure. Keep your eyes on him. Always be thankful. Be joyful. Keep on praying. Don't try to repay evil. He's just going through all of these things saying, look, the letter, it's okay. I got this. I'll take care of you. You keep praying. You keep focused. You keep focused. There will always be distractions. That's why Jesus said that in Luke 9. Keep your hand to the plow. Second aspect is this. Don't confuse free with cheap. Don't confuse free with cheap. See, just because something is free does not mean it's cheap. It can be extremely valuable, but was given to us freely. It can be extremely valuable, but was given to us freely. This explains the wonderful redemption that we experience through Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter, Peter will talk about this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he says these words in verse 18. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he's been revealed for your sake. He says the price tag of our redemption was top notch. Notice then these scriptures that Peter will refer it in comparison and call gold and silver mere gold and silver. He said they're just not really that much compared to the wonderful redemption. Nothing compares to the price that was paid for us. Yet, this extremely valuable redemption is offered to us freely. Extremely valuable, but offered to us freely. All we have to do is exercise faith and believe, and everything in our life is changed. Why? Because we're given, we're forgiven, we're, we're made free from sin and the shame of sin. And so we not only get to live it out here on earth, but through this we have been given eternal life. We're open to the wonderful salvation of God that will last forever. But, but growth is costly. That salvation was free, top price by God, but offered freely to us. But growth is costly. Growth takes discipline. Growth means we embrace discipleship. And Jesus said, when you take that corner, when you go around that corner, and you turn that way, there's a price tag attached. In fact, go back to the Gospel of Luke again, where Jesus will say these words in Luke, the 14th chapter, verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them. Now, before I read any further, I want you to understand that little narrative phrase that's put in that scripture. Note that. He says, a large crowd followed Jesus. People wanted to be around Jesus. But it's like Jesus turns and says to them, listen, I'm going to tell you what this is really all about. Because there's a lot of you that just want to hang out with me. And there's a lot of you that like to wear the uniform. A lot of you that like to stand on the sideline with me. But let me tell you what it's really all about. Here we go. Verse 26. If you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, wife, and mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's 
There's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. What's Jesus doing here? He's laying out the price of discipleship. He looks at the large crowd and he says, listen, I need you to understand. You can experience free salvation. It isn't cheap. It's going to cost everything. And he says, now I want you to understand it's worth everything to follow me. But here's the price Jesus gives, three areas. In verse 26, he talks about relationships. He specifically talks about family relationships, but other relationships as well. Go into discipleship. There are relationships that you probably will not be able to keep in this level if you want to walk with Jesus. Why? Because they will drag you away from your desire to follow Jesus. And he said some of those will be family relationships. They will be difficult. Next, he goes to reputation. He goes relationships, and then he hits reputation. He says you're going to have to deal with your pride and walk in humility. You're going to to take up your cross. You're going to to lay down And I'm going to have to lay down who I am. You're going to lay down who you are and follow who he is. Our reputation, our desire to be number one, our desire to be the king of our life, our desire to lead. He said, that's going to have to be laid down and you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. Our reputation, who I am, can't be more important than who he is in my life. And thirdly, he's going to go down to verse 33 and he's going to finally wrap it up with this. It's going to cost you your rights. Your rights, your relationships, your reputation, and your rights. What do you mean rights? Jesus is asking for total surrender of everything. In other words, I have to declare that I don't have the right to anything. I have the right to serve him. And it's all his. And I'm going to follow him fully. So I can't say, well, I have the right to this, Lord. I have the right to this or this. So he says there's a cost. And so Jesus looks at this large crowd. He says, if you want to Take this corner of discipleship. Remember, don't confuse free with cheap. Your salvation is free. And that salvation allowed you to put your hand to the plow. That salvation gave you positional righteousness. Your hand is now to the plow. You are ready to go. But he says, I want you to understand something. You're entering into a kingdom that you're walking in that I paid for, Jesus says. I paid for with top price. Now I'm asking you. To lay down your life in submission, and that's going to be costly for you. Lastly today, remember the law of attrition. Remember the law of attrition. Now, what does the word attrition mean? Well, in Webster's, attrition means a reduction in numbers, usually as a result of resignation, retirement, or death. Let me repeat that. A reduction in numbers, usually as a result of resignation, retirement, or death. Now, this is a difficult word for us to hear. And the reason is we like increase. We like larger. We like expansion. We like words like that. Attrition is a word that speaks not of larger and expanding, but rather of smaller. Now, in light of discipleship, I want you to hear the words of Jesus and watch something occur That when we read it, it really bothers us. I I think it bothers us because we see ourselves in this scripture. We see ourselves and it's bothersome to us because we, we don't like the way this ends. But it's in John the 6th chapter. I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture here. John 6, I want you to pick it up in verse 47. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they are di- they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Then the people begin arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. 
For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his disciples said, this is a very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining, so he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and he asked, are you going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, the context of the scripture is Jesus has been talking about manna and the bread of life. This is the teaching that we would call typology. What that means is Jesus isn't teaching cannibalism in John the sixth chapter. Rather, he's making a point that the manna in the wilderness, the food that sustained the children of Israel as they were going through the wilderness, he said that food sustained them and they entered into what God had for them. And he said in the same way, I am food for you. If you will feed on the son of man, if you will listen to me and eat of me, he says, just as they ate the bread in the wilderness, you will be sustained. Now they died, he said, they died, but you will not die. You will enter eternal life. And Jesus brings everything to an understanding in verses 61 through 63, when he says these words. Jesus, aware of his disciples were complaining, said, does this offend you? Then he said, that will, uh, that, then what will you think when you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus says, I'm foreshadowing something to you. He's going to talk about it later in John. He's going to say, I am going to leave. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and it's best for you that he comes because he will fill you. He will lead you into all truth. He will be an agent of conviction. He will be your peacekeeper. He will fill you with the Spirit. He said, the words that I'm giving you right now, the words that I'm giving you are spirit and life. They aren't about this natural realm. They aren't about living and following your own self. They are about living and following me through the power of the Spirit. And you will need, he says, to eat and drink of me if you are going to thrive in the kingdom of God. You will need to get your sustenance from me. He said, if you eat and drink of this world, you will die. It will not sustain you. And then attrition sets in. Verse 66, when it says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Sad verse in the Bible. But it's Jesus saying, I'm going to give you a line in the sand. If you put your hands to the plow, you will need to follow me. Listen, I'm going to give you statistics that amaze me, but many of us know the Billy Graham crusade, the Franklin Graham crusade. Years ago, I was in charge of getting the counselors in Valley Center for the Franklin Graham crusade. I met with the leaders of the Franklin Graham crusade, sat down with them, talked to them in my office. Here's what they said. If two out of 10 of the people who go forward at our crusade end up in a local church, we consider it an amazing blessing. Two out of 10. If 20% even end up in a local church, said nothing about discipleship. If just two out of 10 who come forward at a crusade and ask Jesus Christ to come into their life, if just two out of 10, and that's all we're trying to get. That's why we want all the churches involved. We consider that a blessing. The law of attrition. Jesus fed 5,000. Jesus sent out 70. 5,000 were there to eat. And that's just counting the men. So I'm sure there were more than that. 
70 then were able to be trusted to go out. Out of that 70, I, it says many deserted. Jesus is left with 12. From those 12, the inner circle is three. Peter, James, and John, who will go with him all the way to Gethsemane. When Jesus will go to the cross and die, only John followed. One. We went from 10,000 and some probably at a meal to one. The law of attrition. Why? Because the cost to true discipleship is great. And Peter's answer is the key. If we can get this answer in our heart and life, if we can stay focused with our, with our attention on him and we eat and drink of him, here is what Peter says. Peter gives the great answer in verse 68. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life and we believe and we know you're the Holy One of God. Those are the words of discipleship. Those need to be our declaration. Here's the question. Will we put our hands to the plow and not look back? Will we say what we've experienced this past month, what we've experienced since the beginning of the year when we recalibrated our lives, when we looked in resurrection life, when we looked at the responsibility of the kingdom, when we looked at the reality of how the kingdom is lived out through the study of the kings, when we looked at the Holy Spirit and what he came to do, and now we've experienced something remarkable. Will we realize... There will be distractions. And the things that can suck away our emotional energy, we choose to follow him instead. Praying, seeking, walking in the joy of the Lord, putting away the gossip and everything else, and say, I'm staying focused. Will we not confuse free with cheap and realize our salvation is free in Jesus Christ, but the cost was everything to God to redeem us. And we then will give ourselves... And say, the price is not too high. We will deal with and let God sift through our relationships. We will let him take our reputation. We will yield our rights to him. Will we remember the law of attrition? And realize that even though others around us might walk away. And they might find it too difficult. We will follow. We will embrace. Because there is absolutely nowhere else we can go. He has the words of life. We will go after what he has for us. We will totally abandon the other things and totally abandon ourselves so we can walk forward with him in abundant life. Discipleship. It's the next place. My hand is to the plow. I want to be fit for the kingdom of God. I want to be fit to do the work that God has called me to. It's our next step. Put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the privilege of bringing it forth. I pray, God, that today we would decide, we would make the decision, understanding the cost, understanding what this is all about, to go forth from here and live the life of a disciple. We thank you for it and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus love 